Okay, welcome to Growing Your Business Tips and Tools webinar. My name is Conrad Asper, and I'm the Executive Director of Efficiency First California, and I'll be your moderator this morning on behalf of Build It Green and PG&E, who are the sponsors for this webinar. I'd like to welcome um, I'd like to welcome our Energy Upgrade California. I'm sorry, next slide. I'd like to welcome our Energy Upgrade California uh, Home Upgrade Program contractors. It's your work in the Home Upgrade Program and Advanced Home Upgrade Programs that delivers effective energy efficiency services to residents in the PG&E territory. And we thank you for that. As you can see on the slide, the Home Upgrade Program is administered by the Bay Area Regional Energy Network within the nine Bay Area counties, including Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, Napa, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Solano, and Sonoma. On behalf of PG&E, Build It Green administers the home upgrade program outside the Bay Area and is the contact for advanced home upgrade throughout the PG&E territory. Next. I'd also like to welcome our AC quality care program contractors who have been providing HVAC quality care services to homeowners throughout the nine Bay Area counties, including Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, Napa, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Solano, and Sonoma, and uh, the other pg and territory. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter uh, for today's webinar. His name is Mike Rogers. Mike is a popular presenter who draws on his own extensive home performance contracting and consulting expertise and experience to help companies lay a foundation for success using a whole business approach. We'll hear more from Mike on this soon. Next slide. Okay, and today's webinar is both a standalone tutorial on how to plan for success and an introduction to an upcoming series of sales training boot camps. These in-person two-day events will explore today's topics in a hands-on, in-depth manner designed to help each attendee make immediate and lasting improvements to his or her business operations. The sales training boot camps are set for November 4th through 5th in Fresno, California, and November 7th through 8th uh, in Stockton. More dates will be coming soon. The boot camps are free for participating contractors, so mar please mark your calendars. To learn more, contact Build It Green at the phone numbers and or email addresses on the screen. Next slide. Okay, before we get started, uh, I'd like to note that questions may be submitted through our questions panel on your control panel at any time during the webinar. And we encourage questions uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, question answer session will be followed uh, with after Mike's presentation. So we'll, we'll hold questions until then. A uh, recording of the webinar will be available after the event along with a PDF of the presentation slide. You can expand or collapse the control panel at any time by clicking on the red-white arrow in the top left corner of the panel. So please do feel free to submit your questions. Okay, so without further ado, here's Mike. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, could you click to the next slide, please? My goal for today, and I hope the reason you're all here, is that you'd like to be happy and profitable and doing great work for your customers. Um, if that's not the case, then you're probably on the, at the wrong call, and I won't be offended if you sign off. Next slide, please. Um, I've got a few assumptions that I, I want to run through, especially as I hear folks um, struggling over the last few years perhaps with the downturn on the HVAC side, or those of you who are moving into home performance, working in, into the uh, energy upgrade California. Um, I, hey, sometimes it's challenging out there. Uh, at the same time, I want to run through these assumptions because I, it really, this is at the, 
the core, the essence of being in the contracting business for me. Uh, I'm, I, I love saving energy. I love making the world a better place too. But you have to be profitable as a company if you want to have any other goal um, other than just sort of giving yourself a job for the next 20 years. So st let's start off with the assumption that it is okay to be profitable. Next slide, please. Beyond it's okay, you actually can be profitable. And I'm happy to report that there are contractors all around the company, uh, country that are doing quite well. Both on the HVAC side, I've seen companies with tremendous growth over the last uh, five, six years. I've also seen exactly the opposite. I've seen some struggle. But you can be profitable, whether you're HVAC only or whether you take a whole house approach. Next. Um, I'll tell you the one thing, though, that sort of permeates all the successful companies that I've uh, seen. It's not just an accident. They get to profitability, and they sustain their profits, and they grow over time by continued work. And in fact, if they stop working at being successful, quite often they backslide, and, and honestly, it doesn't take very long. If you stop the good practices that allow you to be successful, to turn those profits over year after year after year, if you stop them, within a couple of years, you can very quickly decay into what, unfortunately, looks like the average residential contractor out there. Most contractors don't actually make money. Uh, and I'm talking about the business making money, uh, not just essentially buying yourself a job. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, very quickly introduce myself. Thank you, Conrad, for the introduction. I'm not going to run down the list of what I've done over time. I just want to zero in on the fact that what I'll be talking about today, and I, I'm very fortunate I'll have the opportunity to uh, participate in the, uh, the boot camp and some of the follow-up webinars and some of the other things that uh, Bill the Green and pg and &E are bringing to you. What I'm going to be discussing is based on real-world experiences. Um, I had the uh, opportunity to start a company called Green Homes America, and we grew that uh, to, when I left last year, around 30 locations around the country. Uh, they're, they're still growing. I've had the opportunity both there and in my, my prior life and my life since uh, to literally work with hundreds of contractors around the country, um, large and small, some quite successful, some not so much. Uh, and the things I'm going to talk about are sort of the common themes that, that I've seen. Uh, you know, I'll share some of the stuff that works. I'm also going to share some of the stuff that doesn't work. Uh, frankly, some of the stuff that doesn't work, you can learn a lot more if you pay attention, you're willing to learn less, and you're willing to make the corrections to fix it. Um, I, I know in my own experience, I've got a lot more stuff wrong than I ever got right. But the pathway to success is figuring out what's wrong, figuring out how to, how to do it better, how to fix it, how to make it what's right now. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to touch on, a, a, at, at the very high level, uh, several key elements across the business today. Uh, the reality is, in an hour, we're not going to give you too much that's going to completely transform your business, but there might be a, a, a nugget here, a kernel there, that you can take away and actually start having an impact today or tomorrow. The, the, the deeper lessons, though, and the, the things that you'll be able to really set that foundation with and build on over time, I think are going to happen uh, over the next several months. And kudos to... Uh, PG&E and, and Build It Green for putting this together. This has been identified over the last decade as one of the areas where contractors could use a whole lot of help. Um, almost every year I see folks talking about it at the program level, policy people. What can we do to help contractors make their businesses more vibrant? Well, I see a lot of talking about it, but I almost never see it actually 
put together in, into any sort of coherent plan. Yeah, there's an occasional one-off event or something like this, but what, what I'm seeing now in California is, is really about the first time, certainly in this energy efficiency arena, that I've seen somebody think about sort of the business applications of this, really from soup to nuts um, and with an idea so it's helping contractors progress um, and, and do better than they're doing today so their businesses are more sustainable and profitable. Some of the foundations that we'll talk about, uh, things like uh, key performance indicators and tracking in your business and what metrics and benchmarks you should be measuring yourself again. Uh, how one of the, it, it's said so often it's become trite, but really the, the folks in your company become your company. And if they're not strong enough to, to carry that company forward, the company isn't going to move forward. So we'll, we'll talk about how to strengthen that team. From hiring and, and training, you'll certainly hear me talk a, a lot about training, a uh, huge proponent of it on an ongoing basis, uh, to, to making changes when you need to. Customer service it really is a, a foundation across all of your business. And we're going to touch on elements of why residential contractors, if historically on the trust scale, were somewhere you know down at or below the used car salesman. Uh, a lot of homeowners are very you know scared, concerned, nervous about calling us and inviting us into their homes. Uh, it's not necessarily our fault. Fault. I hope it's not the fault of the folks on the phone here, uh, but certainly our our competitors out there in the industry have not done an excellent job put, putting homeowners' minds at ease when it's time to get work done. And, and then another sort of overarching concept, uh, concept here is systems that, to really help you scale your business. So I'm. Jumping ahead to the very last slide, I'm going to give you a little reading assignment when we leave here today, a book called uh, The E-Myth, um, and it doesn't have anything really to do with electronics. It's, a, it's about entrepreneurship, and how it, it's sort of a sad state of affairs when a lot of residential contractors go, and you know they've been in the, the business for 30 years, 35 years, and it's it's time to move on, and they want to sell their business, and their business is often worth no more than a, uh, a rusty truck and some tools, which is to say the business isn't actually worth uh, anything. They've worked for 30 years, and the, no one's going to write them a, a check for a couple million dollars at the end of that because they haven't worked on their business. Now they've worked in their business and for 30 years they were you know, pulling a paycheck and uh, making the equivalent of the salary as the owner. But the business itself, once you take that owner out of the picture, there's really no there there. There isn't anything that anybody's going to, to write a check and buy other than maybe that customer list or that the, the rusty truck or the tools. You need the systems to scale. And why I mention E-Myth, and I'll circle back to that as a reminder at the end, is it, it, it's really about getting you as owners and managers um, and leaders within a business to focus on, on the business, build the business, and not get distracted working day-to-day -day in the business. Now when you're, you're small and you're a one or two or three or four person shop, you're still working in the business too. But if you want to grow and scale, you've got to step back and put together the systems and processes that are going to allow other people to start moving the business forward. Because even the, the best CEO in the country can't carry uh, an entire business, and certainly not a residential contracting business, uh, on their shoulders if they want to grow. Next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll also talk quite a bit about the importance of planning. Now, many of you may have uh, seen Efficiency First webinars about a uh, business plan and how to put together your business plan and the importance of ha uh, going through that exercise. And you know, I wholeheartedly want to endorse that. Business plans uh, are an excellent starting point, and they help you think through the different parameters of your business. And usually when you do that, you're putting together a pro forma. Uh, 
Uh, it's essentially a financial model that's kind of predicting how your business is going to grow over time, and that sort of fun stuff. Uh, and I, I'm a firm believer in the importance of that planning exercise. You can't stop there, though. Business plans usually get updated you know, every few years, every five years. You do need, though, something that's much more immediate, not an annual basis. Uh, you have to have an operating plan, or what some people simply call a budget. It's important to put that plan or budget in place so you begin to get some sense of how all the pieces of your business put, fit together, um, what it's going to take to add a half million dollars of revenue to your business. Do you know, down, down to the lead, how many additional leads you're going to need? Do you have a plan to generate those additional leads? What's that going to cost you? Uh, what your close rates need to be? What your average ticket needs to be? Not just looking on the revenue side of the equation, but on the expense side of the equation, too. And, and then uh, folding in things like cash flow. Okay, you're going to start selling more. Maybe you're going to start participating in a program, and that's going to generate some uh, additional work for you. And maybe you're an HVAC contractor, and you want to add, buy a foam truck. I hear this one all the time. Well, how are you going to justify that $70,000, $80,000 capital expense, and what's your cash flow going to look like? Cash becomes really, really important, and even if you have a successful, profitable model, if you don't have any money to pay your bills and pay your staff on Friday, you're going to be in big trouble real fast. Um, so I will talk quite a bit about planning and then how it intersects with some of the hot topics that I'm sure you all want to know about, like marketing and how do I generate leads. Um, and sales and how can I close more and how can I... Uh, price and run these jobs so they're more profitable. Uh, the answers to a lot of those questions are going to in part depend on what your plan looks like and where you have wiggle room and where you have opportunity for improvement and where you have an absolute need to improve and, and very, very quickly or, you know, the house of cards falls down. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so I, I feel, uh, although we'll talk quite a bit about marketing and sales, I like to start with the foundation because it gives us the tools and some of the vocabulary that we need to dive into some of the more fun topics like marketing. So we're going to talk about marketing quite a bit. We'll talk uh, about planning and evaluation and, and how do I get this message across. Um, what, what is AC Quality Care? What, what am I doing as an HVAC company when I come to your house to make your life better? Or what am I doing as a whole house contractor consultant to solve your problems and, again, make your life better? Not just what am I doing to give you a higher seer air conditioner or uh, throw some insulation up in your attic. We're going to look at tactics, some of the old stuff, the stuff that uh, still works, the stuff that doesn't work anymore. And we're going to look at some new tactics, things that you might not be doing in your business now, things that maybe uh, residential contractors from other sectors, and, and I look to the HVAC guys because some of the sharpest residential contractors I know are from the HVAC side. Now, don't go breaking your arm patting yourself on the back HVAC guys because some of the worst I know are also on the HVAC side. But we're we're going to take the opportunity to look at things that work. Uh, what do I mean by work? Well, they generate leads, and they generate leads cost-effectively so that we're not spending every dollar that comes in the door just trying to get the next lead. You know, we actually have to pay our folks to do the work and pay our overhead and hopefully keep a little profit at the end of the day, too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as we get into, you know, talking about messaging, uh, I'll go back to this quote from Amory Lovins back from the 70s, and Amory's the guy who kind of, through his writings, I, I finally had the opportunity to meet the man about five years ago. Um, prior to that, it was really just through his, his fighting and work at the Rocky Mountain Institute, et cetera, his work with, that he'd been doing with Fortune 500 companies or around the company, around, uh, I'm sorry, around the country and around the world. Um, most people, as it turns out, don't really care about energy efficiency. 
They, they may say they do, but at the end of the day, that's not how they make their decision. Um, they don't get too excited about you know, that new Linux or carrier or pick your brand piece of equipment. They don't really care too much about the difference between cellulose and fiberglass and foam. Um, we in the industry might care a whole lot about some of that stuff. But most people, as uh, Amory said, they want cold beer and hot showers. Uh, you have to really distill their wants and needs down, put everything we do in, in the context of the customer, not in the context of our companies, not in the context of some program that we might be working for, in the context of what am I going to do for you that's going to, in essence, make your life better, make something easier for you, make a problem that you're having go away, and prep preferably something that you really care enough about and, and you care enough about to open up your checkbook and write me a large check so I can do all those things for you. Um, and if we don't do that, people are going to get distracted. You know, they're going to go out and buy their new iPhone 6 or <laughs> they're going to buy a boat or take a vacation or do any one of a million things other than the stuff, the services that we offer them. Next slide. In addition to the messaging, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at tactics and, and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we, we don't have time today to really go through the laundry list of tactics, but I'm going to call a couple out to you right now. Other than um, some high-performing HVAC companies, most residential contractors uh, do a, a pretty poor job what I have seen are the most important source of leads that you will have, um, and that is referrals. Whether they're generated from your customers or by your employees, um, whether it's a service technician in a house bringing new business to you, or whether you have a program to make customers really happy and then leverage that happiness to get them to talk to their friends and family and neighbors so that when they're ready, to, to make some sort of improvement, you're the company they call. If in a well-performing company you should see referrals, again, whether it's customer generated or employee generated, driving your leads. Um, and we can talk about ways to get there. On the other hand, and you know, we're, we're here graciously, and again, uh, I, I thank PG&E, I thank the counties, I thank Bill the Green for the opportunity to talk with you folks. But most places around the country, um, it's not the program that are driving leads. Programs do great things. Um, it, give me a, a well-designed, well-executed program, and you know, I'll, I'll sign up. I'll participate all day long, and I can find ways to leverage all that good stuff to do better for my customers, do better for my uh, company, and, and make the program happy, too. But it's not very often that you're going to see the program actually uh, generate leads to sustain your business. Sometimes it'll happen in the short term, and you're going to get uh, you know, a really happy week or month or maybe even a little bit longer. But I, I cannot find a single example in the long term in the residential contracting space where programs are able to completely sustain a, a business. Um, even if they're able to generate a lot of leads, that attracts your competition, and now those leads get divided out amongst more and more and more and more participating contractors. So even if they're able to maintain a high level of leads, you don't get as many of them um, over time. The important thing is figure out what works. Own your business. We'll talk about the important things like referrals. Um, and as you're getting into this and going back to building your plan, if your plan says, I'm going to get 1,000 free leads from the program every year, then we need to roll up our sleeves and, and take a hard look and, and really evaluate if that's the business that you want to be in because it's probably not going to happen. Next. And um, you know, to, to that end, while we're talking about marketing, and I want to start to tee up your thinking uh, about some of the important numbers here uh, and also help prepare for some of the sessions that we're going to have next week and in the, the months ahead. I'd like to take a quick poll here. So I'll keep talking for you know, the next 45 
seconds or a minute, but if you could please answer this poll question. As a percentage of revenue, how much do you spend on marketing? Uh, the, the, <laughs> the responses are anonymous. I'm not going to know who you are or what your answer was, um, but it will help sort of a, establish a baseline of where people are at. And by the way, there is no right or wrong answer here. I have seen very successful companies spending less than 2% a year on marketing. I'm going to be talking about how they can do that. Um, I've also seen very successful companies who spend as much as 20% of their um, annual revenue on marketing. And, uh, and I've seen folks successful and unsuccessful everywhere in between. Uh, well, let, let's see where you folks are at, though. We'll give you another uh, about 15 seconds. Please do respond. I, I mentioned planning, and I'm asking this, uh, th this question right now, sort of anticipating a question I'll get next week. And, well, and I, I'm going to give you a hint um, at some of the answers. Um, one of the questions I get is, how much should I spend on marketing? And my, one of my answers, a very satisfactory answer, I'm sure you'll agree, is, I don't know. <laughs> What does it cost you to generate a lead? What does your plan say about how much marketing you can afford to do? How much historically what has that average lead costed you? Um, how many leads do you need to hit your plan for next year? When we run through that plan, how many dollars are, kind of, are, are set aside for marketing? Does that total dollar volume and the average cost per lead, does that line up with what you really need? just hinting at one of the reasons why we got to do planning because I can't answer that question for you in your business um, if, if we don't really know what your business looks like. So taking a, a look at these results, they um, actually line up kind of fairly well with uh, what, what I've seen in the past. There aren't too many folks less than 3%. Um, I'm very intrigued. The 9% or more um, that, that's sort of a, an anomaly. Usually I don't see 36% of the, the people saying they spend 9% 9, 9 or more. In fact, uh, I usually don't see more than 3, 4, 5% of people saying that. Uh, having done this several times, um, been on a couple panels with other contractors over the last year, Somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, seven to eight percent seems to be where most people are responding. Um, seven to eight percent then might be a decent number for planning purposes if you have no historical information in your own company. But again, uh, it doesn't matter so much what the guy next to you is spending. It matters that what what does your plan look like? What does it cost you? Not him or her, what does it cost you to generate those leads and are you budgeting and spending enough to actually generate the, the leads you need to sustain yourself? So pretty interesting and, and when we talk uh, more in, por in person uh, next week and beyond, I'd love to hear from some of the folks spending 9% um, or more. Uh, there, there's, there may be some opportunities there. Two things, you have to spend enough to generate the leads to sustain the business. Uh, but you don't want to spend more than you have to. Every dollar you spend that you don't need to be spending, is that, that's a, uh, a lost dollar of profits there. So even the folks that are spending pretty aggressively right now, if we can figure out a way to get the same results for a few dollars less, you may instantly be able to drop those savings to your bottom line and have something to smile about at the end of the year. Next slide, please. Where are we at? We're at sales. Um, uh, obviously, we didn't learn everything we needed to know about marketing, but you do have uh, something to sort of calibrate yourself a little uh, against and start thinking about that so we can dive more deeply into it next week. Consultative sales. I'm going to talk about a, a, a basic selling system. And I'm pretty much, other than saying, 
I don't advocate the uh, old school hardcore Tin Man approach. I'm not going to talk about that approach because I don't think it's effective today for most customers. Um, I don't think it lines up with the uh, type of business that I'd like you all to be, the, the business that can command um, fair prices. And by fair, I don't mean low. By fair, I mean something that has a uh, fair margin and a fair profit in it for you. If it doesn't have a profit uh, in it for you at the end of the day, then it doesn't meet my definition of fair pricing. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the uh, basic systems you can set up to sort of incorporate a consultative sales approach. <clears throat> Here's something, by the way, where I think uh, the those of you in the energy upgrade and who've taken a whole house approach, you, you have something that people who are not taking a whole house approach, um, you, you have an enormous asset here. Because you can take a look at that entire home, figure out what all the problems are, and if the if they called you for an air conditioner, but what they really need is um, duct sealing and insulation and, and that sort of thing, that their attic is almost completely uninsulated, you can offer them a much better solution than somebody who is selling, even if it is the best box, who is only selling boxes, uh, HVAC equipment. Uh, so th there's neat things that that everybody on the uh, phone right now brings to the conversation. We're going to talk about the importance of a, a service tech and how you can build an entire business around this. And sometimes when I start talking about HVAC and the opportunity for an HVAC company to add a lot more, uh, you know, you'll see me get goosebumps because the opportunity is amazing there, uh, but only if they take advantage of it. And it, this works in both directions. If you are a whole house focused company, but you haven't yet fully integrated HVAC, I'm going to talk about some opportunities there. If you're an HVAC company, sure, we're, you can stick where you are right now, and we'll talk about a lot of things to help you do better, but I'd be remiss if I didn't point out some of the other opportunities by expanding your array of services. Consultative sales, and one of the, uh, the key tenets of it is really listening to understand You've got to listen to your customers. We're going to go through exercises that are going to help you develop the skills to do that. Um, back to that home performance. Um, but even on the HVAC side, when you were talking about the, a consultative approach, diagnostics can play a good role as long as you know, you're keeping it customer focused, you're focusing on that the cold beer and warm showers, you're not geeking out on widgets and, and jargon and that sort of thing. Uh, nonetheless, using diagnostics and demonstrating your expertise and finding the right problem so you can offer the right solution is a huge advantage, and it's a way to set yourself apart from 95% of the other contractors out there very, very easily. And uh, you know, all of this means nothing if at the end of the day you don't actually get a a signature on a contract that allows you to do some work. Um, you're not happy uh, if you're participating in a program, they're not happy because it's actually contracted work and installed work uh, that uh, allows us to see the benefits that we're looking for. Next slide, please. I've had the uh, opportunity in my travels around the country to talk to some, some really sharp folks, including people from other industries, and I wanted to share something with you uh, from a, a plane ride several months ago about list, this guy happened to be from the pharmaceutical industry, but we, we talked for, for probably uh, three hours on the uh, transcontinental flight comparing notes about sales approaches um, and found that we were essentially, sometimes we were using different words, but we were essentially saying the same things about what works and what didn't work. And one of the really neat things about this guy is he had tons of data because these companies had paid millions of dollars to collect data. Now, he wouldn't show me the raw data, but we had some fun, you know, drawing some charts and stuff in our seats. And here's one of them. This is just a uh, your, your standard bell curve of um, sales performance on the... Uh, the vertical axis there, it's just the number of advisors, and the horizontal axis is um, 
how, how much they sell. So if you go further out, that's a higher performing advisor. If you're closer to the left, that's a low performing advisor. He's not selling as much. It looks kind of like your standard distribution. Well, that, some, some pretty remarkable things that we already know is true, but this guy had actual data and numbers. Um, the low performing guys, when they were in a sales call, they, they let a customer get in one word for every seven words that they said. Contrast that, it was almost exactly the opposite for the high performing guys. For the high performing sales guys, the customers use seven words for every word they said. It, it, pretty, pretty remarkable. And a lot of these sales guys didn't even realize that was happening. Uh, it, certainly, I'm not going to talk about counting words and how to artificially <laughs> stimulate the customer to, to talk more about just random things. The way you get more uh, your customer to talk more is to ask questions. This graph just shows how really, really important it is to get the customer talking. Um, so we're going to work on some of the good types of questions to ask, questions that are a little bit more involved than how old is your house, um, you know, how many air conditioning units do you have, what is your set point. Yeah, those are great questions, but there, there's other very, very important questions that are going to do two things. They're going to help you understand what's going on with that customer, what they really care about. The other neat thing about questions is asking the question and getting the customer to, to explain something to you helps them understand what they really care about. You, you actually learn a, a whole lot more when you have to explain something to somebody. Um, so. We're going to go through different types of questions that you have to practice asking. When I say different types of questions, I'm not focusing on the content of the question, just how you ask the question. Next slide, please. <clears throat> While we're um, on the, the sales front here, another quick poll. I'm actually going to ask a couple questions, but we'll, we'll start right now. What is your company's average sales closing rate? And I ask company, uh, we'll probably see a little skewed results here for the smaller companies, um, but, but go ahead and answer this based on the, your company, what you're seeing right now in terms of how many sales you close. Now, there, there's going to be a few anomalies that pop up here because we all define closing rates a little bit differently. My definition is quite simply, how many leads did you run? over a period, you know, whether it's a month or a year, that's in the denominator. And how many did you sell up in the top? Um, if we break it down to a, a weekly or monthly basis, sometimes you can see some funny things there. I ran 10 appointments this week, um, and I sold 12 jobs. I have a 120% closing rate. Well, sometimes, you know, the, the work I did last week or last month actually resulted in a close this week. So you can see things like that in the short term. Once you start getting out over a month, a quarter, a year, um, that closing rate starts converging on a number that makes a little bit more sense. The, um, the other thing that I, I see quite a bit, and this will be interesting teasing out when we're uh, live in person, the, uh, the smaller company, where it's still the owner, operator, the rugged entrepreneur, still working in the business, not working on the business. I've seen owners with uh, closing rates 60, 70, sometimes even uh, a little bit higher, 60, 70 percent. Um, what happens then is they start hiring people, planning on having everybody else sell at 60, 70 percent, and the other guys are closing at 20 percent. 25, maybe 30, um, and the numbers look a whole lot different when you're selling at 25% versus 70%. So uh, pretty good distribution here. Um, it, it actually looks like we have a, uh, if, if these are really your company numbers, we have a, a fairly high-performing group on the phone. Um, most of the time, I'm not seeing uh, a whole lot of people above that 40%. 
um, when I look at just an average population. When I look at high-performing companies, uh, that's when I start seeing company averages in that 50% range, and that's where I think you all ought to be, you know, fit, aiming for 50% or better. And it's achievable. You can get there if you have some systems in place and if you work those systems and if you continue to train. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to do another quick poll question here. Uh, how big is your average sale? Now, um, HVAC guys, I'm talking about um, in, in installation, a, a replacement. Not, I'm not looking for uh, what's your average service ticket here. <clears throat> this varies widely, but we're going to get we'll get here a little bit to talk about some of the opportunities. Now, if you're a remodeling contractor, we, <laughs> I, I see folks with average um, projects in the literally the hundreds of thousands of a dollar range. Uh, my brother who lives there in the Bay Area recently completed a kitchen remodel that was six hundred thousand dollars. You know, that's a little bit mind-boggling to me. <laughs> uh, somebody who's coming at this sort of on the other end of the spectrum from pretty much uh, an insulation air sealing perspective, you might see projects down in the two and $3,000 range. So the nature of your business is obviously going to drive that a little bit. Um, and averages alone don't tell the whole story. It's obviously the average ticket and the number of tickets. Um, Five to, to 9,000, so I'm guessing we have a fair number of uh, HVAC contractors doing, um, you know, typical AC replacements. I don't know the averages in, the, um, in your particular areas. Around the country, a, a good number for an average HVAC uh, installation is about $6,500. Looks like this group is kind of squarely in that camp. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right. What I, what I won't be talking about you know, next week and what won't be the focus of this whole series, both the uh, in-person sessions and the webinars, is the technical stuff. So. Let, let's say you're participating in ACQC and you, uh, or the uh, AC Quality Care Program, um, and you know you, you want to learn more about some of the, the technical specs and standards and how to get your technicians there. This isn't the right training for that. Um, I love talking about that stuff, but I mean, believe me, the uh, Geeking out on building science is actually the thing that really um, gets me excited. But over the last several years, I, um, I've had the opportunity to uh, participate in uh, that side of the business a whole lot less because nobody else was focusing on the business. Everybody wants to play with blower doors and um, their new foam rig and all that fun sort of stuff. And Again, I do too. But that's not what we're going to talk about here, because you get to do a whole lot more of that if you figure out how to make your business work. Um, nor will this be a magic bullet, because there are no magic bullets in residential contracting. It's really about the fundamentals, the blocking and tackling, and getting all that stuff right, putting the systems and processes in place to get it right and improve it day in and day out and over time. And then also, you know, have the uh, feedback loops and the tracking because things change. Equipment changes, laws change, um, insurance rates change, the uh, the hiring pool changes. All sorts of things that impact our business change, and we've got to be constantly monitoring and adjusting the business to accommodate those changes. Um, and the way we succeed, though is by getting, again, all the fundamentals right. You can't start addressing the really hard stuff if you haven't taken care of the really easy stuff already. Next, please.
all this sort of a, a long way of getting to why attend this series. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of training, and we're going to dive into that sort of from a staff perspective. Uh, training training's really expensive, and I certainly appreciate what it takes you and some of your key staff to take time out of your day, for example, to go sit through a two-day class next week um, and then carve out time on a regular basis to sit through a series of webinars. Uh, it, absolutely, that's expensive, and, and we darn well better make it worth your while. So the things that we're going to provide to you are all about what can we do to boost up our revenue. Well, we've got to get more leads. We've got to increase our closing rate. We've got to increase our average ticket size. Um, how can we turn that, that higher revenue um, into bigger profits? Well, we've got to make sure our pricing is in order. We've got to make sure we're operating efficiently so we can get the most margin out of it. Um, we're going to talk about things that really allow you to set yourself apart from at least 95% of the residential contractors out there and through things like the um, Quality Care Program or Energy Upgrade California, you allow you to differentiate yourself and really get ahead of the curve. It, going back to that HVAC to home performance example, you know, when we started cooking up green homes back in 2006, almost no one in the HVAC industry wanted to, to talk about home performance. You know, the, the really uh, advanced guys were talking a little bit about maybe indoor air quality and, and some add-ons to their average ticket. No one was talking about that. Roll ahead to 2013, and, you know, ACCA is putting on building performance contract in, um, conferences. There, there are half a dozen groups running around the country um, trying to help HVAC contractors get into this. If, if I look at some of the leading HVAC companies, not just in California, then there certainly are some there, but around the country. More and more of them are seeing the opportunity here, and they're moving in. And the guys that made that move two and three years ago built up a pretty big lead, and their lead is growing. The folks who get into it now over the next couple of years, they're going to have an opportunity to, um, to get a piece of that pie. And the guys who wait five years or ten years, are going to be playing catch-up, and they may never catch up. So you've got an opportunity, if you can start doing things better today, to differentiate yourself, set yourself apart from your competition, grow, gain a lead, and set things in place to be able to sustain that lead over time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, some of the, the uh, common threads that sort of permeate all of this, and, and yeah, I'm going to repeat myself on the important stuff because it's important. It's actually one of the tenets of training. You don't just uh, say something once and expect that it's now going to happen. Um, you, you may be that one or, or two top performing example companies where you teach your tech something one time and you know for the rest of their lives that's exactly the way they're going to do it. But uh, I've yet to meet that company. <laughs> I don't think it actually exists. You have to you know, reinforce and repeat and reinforce some more. Some of the threads, you have to know what business you're in. Uh, I see this all the time sort of in the residential contracting space. Hey, here's a program. Let me sign up for it. Uh, because it's going to you know, get me these leads, um, and there's this incentive, and I think I'm going to sell a little bit more. Great. Sounds good. How does it fit into your core business, though? How does it fit into that plan? What does it actually cost you? What's your equipment investment? How long is it going to sustain? Uh, do, uh, can you get the additional revenue, and more importantly, the additional margins and profitability uh, to be able to justify what it costs to, to spend that money. Um, and I'm suggesting that you ought to be asking those questions uh, before you, you go ahead and dive in. And if you haven't 
you know, sort of modeled out your business and have a good sense of where you are and what it takes to take that next step, then you ought to be really careful. Because I've actually seen contractors add new lines or participate in programs and essentially drive themselves out of business because they weren't ready to take that next step and they didn't think through the consequences. You know, from a, a cash flow or a return on investment or any one of a, a number of different angles. Next slide, please. There's, um, uh, n next, please. There's a number of uh, market opportunities here. Market opportunities, great. But there's a big opportunity in the uh, spray foam business right now. Does that mean that you should run out and buy a, uh, a spray rig right now? No, maybe not. Um, because maybe that's not what you're really good at. Maybe that's not what you're better at than everybody else. Maybe there's somebody who can do it better and more cheaply, and you ought to be looking at partnering with them rather than dumping 70 grand on a, a new truck. And does it fit into your business, and is it something that you care about that you're going to take the time to make work and fully integrate? And it's only really at the intersection of the opportunity and what you're good at and what you care about that you hit the sweet spot where you're really going to make money, not just for six months and then be kind of stuck holding the bag, but where you're going to thrive over time. Next slide, please. I talked about sort of in the foundational element, and we're going to talk about this repeatedly as we talk about marketing and sales. You customer service is is absolutely essential. You do not want to become that stereotypical, typical, um, slimy residential contractor. There, there's too many of them. We, we've got enough of those examples. Let's be the good guys here. Next, please. You know, I grew up in a uh, residential contracting business and uh, swore that I would never have anything to do with it. My dad was an amazing craftsman. Um, you know, still is. You know, retired in his 70s now, still is an amazing craftsman. Um, but wasn't a really a great businessman, and he ran a real small company, but mo mostly focused uh, until he made a, a career change later in life. Um, mostly focused on the residential side. And, you know, the phone calls would come in, and they were coming in uh, first on the home phone, and later he got a business line. Sometimes it was, you know, the kids, me, you know, some punk teenager answering the phone and maybe writing the message down on the paper towel that happened to be next to the microwave and then cleaning up a mess with the paper towel and throwing it away. Uh, the point is... <laughs> He didn't have a system to kind of capture those customer calls coming in, whether it was a new lead or whether it was a follow-up or a question. Um, sometimes the information got captured. Sometimes he was good about returning the call. Sometimes I threw the information away or I memorized it and then didn't write it down and never even passed the message along. I'm not blaming myself for my dad's business here, but... Uh, <laughs> I know I, I wasn't really the guy that was nailing it for him when I was 13 years old, um, you know, watching TV while pretending to take a message for his business. You, you don't want to be the company that doesn't get the messages right, that doesn't return the phone calls, that doesn't set an appointment for 10.30 in the morning and show up, you know, no later than 10.29 in the morning and meeting that customer's expectation every single time. Next, please. Very, very common complaint. In addition to working with contractors, which is the thing I uh, like to do best, I've had an opportunity to work with lots of programs. In fact, again, it's the program that invited me to participate in this conversation today and in the uh, trainings next week. Uh, well, in working with the programs, one of the very common threads we hear is customers who aren't happy because well, I had this audit done, and I haven't heard back in six weeks, in eight weeks, in three months. <laughs> now, contractors wonder why they're not selling more. They, they might have done the perfect audit. They might have had that perfect sales 
visit all except for the, it's not perfect if you don't actually get the signature on the contract. Um, they might have done everything well, but then they don't follow up and they leave the customer hanging and, and all that excitement and energy and willingness to proceed gets lost and turned into frustration. Homeowners get really frustrated because they don't know what the next step is and the contractors don't follow up. You may be different, but there's too many guys who aren't different. It's a pretty low bar we've got to clear in this industry to stand out as exceptional. But more of us need to clear that low bar so we do stand out as exceptional. So don't be that stereotype. Next. We're going to talk quite a bit about uh, systems here. And next, please. Uh, I mentioned that early on, uh, and I'll mention it again. When I give you that recommended reading at the end here, EMIF, you have to start focusing on the business and not completely overwhelm yourself by working in the business. You know, generating every lead yourself, making every sale yourself, making every, sure everything is installed properly yourself. You've got to have the systems to be able to train people to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm not just talking, next slide please, I'm not just talking about uh, a CRM system so you don't have that coffee stained napkin because you took the message over lunch um, on your cell phone and essentially your voicemail box is your, rec or, or your email inbox is your complete record keeping system. Um, it doesn't work. If the, vo if the message is in your voicemail, then you're Crews don't have the message. If the message is in your inbox, then the rest of the company doesn't have access to that message. That's not the best way forward. Next, please. Uh, mentioned it before. See, I'm starting to repeat already. This is a big one for me. Training. Very few companies train enough. On the other hand, I've seen very successful companies with bigger training budgets than entire programs, companies that spend well over $100,000 a year training their staff. Um, it's really important, and they don't do it as a, a, a week-long training event. No, th this is the sort of stuff that gets repeated and done week in, week out at a regular basis. Going over new things, going over stuff we already know to make sure we still know it. Next. Um, in the interest of, I've got a, a couple of fun examples here in the interest of time and to allow ourselves uh, a chance to get to some of your questions, I'm just going to go forward here. Next, please. Um, very, you know, that, that company that spends $100,000 uh, on training, fair question. Well, what if I train my folks and then they leave? And then they go work for my competitor, or they decide to go start up their own company. I just invested, you know, thousands of dollars in training an individual, or tens of thousands of dollars in training them over time, and now they're going to leave and go work for somebody else. Totally fair question. Uh, next slide, please. The way to address that, however, is not by not training them. What if you don't train them and they stay? and do crappy work, both from a quality perspective, um, from a customer satisfaction perspective, from a morale perspective, what if they stick around? You didn't train them and they're still there. So the, the implication behind and the answer behind what if I train them and they leave isn't don't train them, it's get them to stay. And we'll talk about ways to get them to stay, and that's through compensation and the good work environment. Um, Making them want to keep that job. It is, the answer is not don't train them. Next. As I stated before when I gave that marketing example um, and showed yeah, that the, the typical company and the typical program cannot rely on the program to generate leads. Next, please. Um, it's 
you have a tremendous opportunity. <laughs> Both the uh, AC Quality Care and the Energy Upgrade California program are among the most generous programs in the country. There, there are really nice incentives on the table. Um, you have uh, free or subsidized training available. You have wonderful things um, that a lot of your peers around the country don't have. Uh, at the same time, though, you don't want to hand over to any program uh, responsibility for your marketing or your sales or maintaining quality in your business or uh, operating efficiently, any of that sort of stuff. Next. At the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for your business. And it, when you have such generous programs, you take a look at the programs and you figure out, because you've made the plan, how the program fits in to your business, and then you work it accordingly. Um, but don't ever lose sight of the fact that this is your business. You decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and how you're going to deliver quality and, and customer satisfaction in a way that makes sense. And you've got to take that ownership. Uh, the, the program can't do it for you, they won't do it for you, and you don't even want them to, to do it for you. Uh, you. You'll hear me repeat, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. I talked about that plan and having an annual budget or operating plan. Well, putting the plan in place is one thing, next, uh, but that's not enough. You have to measure yourself against that plan. I said I was going to be generating you know, 28 leads a week. Well, how am I doing? How many leads a week am I generating? I said I was going to be doing it at an average cost of $250. Well, am I gener are they costing me $300 or are they only costing me $150? Um, am I spending too much? Uh, do I need to find something more effective? Am I not generating enough uh, leads to begin with? You have to not just have that plan in place, but you have to measure yourself against the plan, see where your assumptions are, are right, see where they're wrong. If they're wrong, figure out, A, do I need to do something to correct this? B, do I need to fix the plan so it lines up better with reality? And if that's the case, does the plan still work? At the end of the day, can I still make money in this if this is the new reality? Um, uh, a couple of closing things before we turn it over to the rest of your questions. Uh, what, and we're, we're, we won't hear about all of the, the topics, no doubt, next week. But again, we have the, uh, the good fortune here because of the wisdom of PG&E and Build It Green to be able to sustain this thing over time and not just have a, a one-off, one- or two-day event. Um, I'd love to hear your input right now on what some of the marketing topics that you really want to hear about. And the, uh, the burning issues, I'll find a way to incorporate them um, next week. And some of the, uh, the other ones are the ones that are going to need reinforcement over time. We'll work those into the webinar series. So please, uh, we'll take another 10 seconds or so. All right, we're going to wrap this poll up and move very quickly to another one. I started with marketing and focused on marketing uh, because the, the feedback that I hear from a lot of contractors really revolves around marketing, how I need more leads, I need more leads, I need more leads. Um, and leads are really important, and we are going to talk about marketing and ways to uh, cost-effectively get those leads. But there's other stuff we want to talk about, too. Um, so another very quick poll. Again, some of this uh, I can quickly modify to address if we're not addressing it already next week. Um, and some of it we will make sure to address in the uh, webinar series over time. So what are the other business topics that you want to hear about? Uh, select any that apply here. Um, and if there's something that's not on the list, please you know, take five seconds right now. Uh, if you're watching this on the webinar, you can go into your chat box um, and type in a, a, a few quick topics. 
If you don't have enough time right now, um, send Bill with Green an email or send me an email, and we'll make I'll I'll forward it to Bill with Green, and we will make sure um, that we uh, consider ways to work those into the conversation. All right, super. <clears throat> Just a, a couple of things, and we'll repeat this information so you, you can see it over the, uh, the remaining 25 minutes or so. Uh, those of you coming to the uh, sessions next week, uh, and I believe there still is time to sign up if you haven't already, uh, I've got a little bit of homework for you. I'd like you to review your, your numbers a little bit. So when we're talking about um, what does it cost to generate a lead and uh, how many leads a week do you need, what's your close rate, what's your average ticket size. If you weren't sure when you were answering some of those questions earlier, take, take a look. I increase your comfort level that you got a good handle on that. It will really help some of the stuff resonate with you. Um, you'll also hear from some of your peers, you'll hear some examples um, and you say, wow, I'm doing really well or, ooh, wow, I'm not doing it so hot on that one. Um, and if, if you actually know what the numbers are, you'll get a lot more out of it. If you've got burning questions, write them down. Feel free to, again, send them to Build a Green or to, to me in advance. But we're, we're going to put you on the spot. We're going to ask you some of those questions right off the bat when you walk in the door. So start thinking about some of the things that you really want to work on and focus on because it will help the messages resonate and it will help us tailor the experience to best uh, meet your needs. And then lastly, we're, we're going to have several exercises in each of these uh, two-day assignments, um, some of which are going to be, you know, writing some stuff down, uh, maybe crunching a couple numbers, a lot of which are going to involve you uh, putting on your, your little actor robe and uh, standing up and acting out a scene as a salesperson, as a technician, as a homeowner. Um, because this is the type of training that I'm going to be asking you to do with your folks in the office. So we, we're actually going to, I'm not just going to give you the exercises, we're going to practice them so you get a sense of what that's like. Oh, here's how I can carve 20 minutes out of my sales meeting or, uh, you know, a half hour out of my all-hands meeting to get these points across. Um, suggest some of the types of activities you can do to, to really make the points sink in and that, that you can incorporate into regular training programs for you. Next, please. Uh, lastly, I mentioned it uh, earlier on. Uh, just flash it up here if, in case you're not familiar with the book. Uh, I, I'm actually going to be recommending next week, uh, get, make sure your Amazon account's ready because I'm going to have another half dozen uh, recommended resources for you from things on marketing to selling, uh, what have you. But I, I think the e-myth is a good one because it's where most residential contracting businesses fail. You know, a lot of our businesses started because we were uh, technicians who thought we could do it better than the last guy. And the reality, we probably could if we took enough time to actually work on the business um, enough time to kind of get out of the crawl space or get out of the attic, turn in the wrench to figure out how marketing and sales and operations all fit together. All right, well, thank you for that. And uh, if there are questions, let's dive right into it. And I, I, I do uh, want to remember to say before we sign off, I look forward to seeing many, many of you uh, in person in both Fresno and Stockton next week. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, this is really good stuff. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank you for your insights. Uh, I'm really happy to have your expertise here with us today. Also, uh, I want to thank the attendees, the participating contractors on the call. I know you've taken time out of your day today um, to, to be on this call, and we really hope it was productive for you, and we hope these boot camps will be productive for you as well. Uh, it's an investment, but um, it's a good one. Again, remember today's webinar is both uh, a standalone tutorial uh, on how to plan for success and an introduction to the upcoming sales 
uh, training boot camps. So um, please do remember these uh, boot camps and get involved uh, November 4th through 5th in Fresno and November 7th through 8th in Stockton. And for more information, uh, you can contact Build It Green for that. Okay, so um, we have a couple questions in here from some of the folks on the phone. And um, first one, Mike, uh, going back to the working in the business versus working on the business, uh, how do I know when I should move from, as you say, working in the business to working on the business? Is that a matter of project volume or number of employees or what? Uh, great question. And yeah, there are some fairly uh, predictable and, and constant uh, plateaus that we see. Obviously, if you're starting up, you, you're going to be, and it's just a small one or two person operation, you're going to be spending a lot of your time working in the business. You don't have staff yet. Uh, you don't have sufficient volume to actually justify having staff. Uh, so in the early days, you know, you get to work your 40 hours a week out doing the job, uh, but then one of the fun things about growing your business is it's not just a 40 hour a week job. Um, you get to go back to the office or go back home and, you know, it's, it's nights and weekends to figure out how to take it up to the next level. And I just mentioned some of the plateaus. We see a lot of residential contracting businesses, um, that don't really ever make it out of that sort of one, two, three, or maybe it's a, a person in, a, in one or two crews. Um, they never kind of make it out of that, uh, the three quarters of a million to a million dollar range. Um, and th there's actually nothing wrong with that. I know some very happy people <laughs> in businesses that look like that. Um, but they never put some of the right pieces in place. They still got to either generate all the leads and generate all the sales. And that's kind of, if you think about it, three quarters of a million to a million. Um, if you've got, got to do, uh, if you've got a guy doing sales part-time and then doing other elements of the business part-time, can't really sell much more than a million dollars a year and you're never going to grow beyond that. Um, now, as soon as you start showing, generate additional leads and hiring some additional sales guys, well, it's, immediately you have to start working on the business if you want to thrive because most likely you're not going to find sales guys who are as good as you are. You're going to have to, because if, if they were dynamite, they'd already be working for somebody else or uh, they would have started their own business. You're going to have to train them to get them there. Um, the more time you focus on getting them up to that level that you performed at, you know, the sooner you can kind of work yourself out of the sales end of that business. And now you can have two or three guys selling instead of you and boom, you know, you, you see then, once once people figure out that I've got to train people to do that sales function, you'll see a lot of businesses grow to the two to three million dollar range, and then they plateau again. Well, what, what's usually going on here is they're trying to run the business out of their head. They don't have systems in place to be able to grow it. Um, and although they may have delegated some of that sales function, they're still making sure their fingers in every other element of the business. You know, they're they're out there on every single job. Um, they're actually climbing up into the attic and and doing the work alongside the guys, not training the guys to do the work, doing the work alongside of these guys. So they don't have the systems, and and maybe beyond that sales function, they're not delegating any additional work. You'll see many companies. Plateau. The, the biggest plateau is that first one. Most don't make it above a million. Then two to three million. They they've got a couple things they delegated, but they didn't they didn't really hand off the ball, and they don't have the systems. And then you'll see another plateau around five million or so, and and that is you. They figured out some of the delegation responsibilities. There's usually some systems and processes issue, and they're not scaling and they're reinventing the wheel too much. Thanks, Mike. Good, good, um, good response on that. Um, so I, I did want to uh, remind uh, folks on the phone that uh, we do have questions available. You can submit your questions through the questions panel or questions pane 
on your control panel. Um, so please go ahead and do that. We've got about 15 minutes left here. Um, another question in, Mike. Um, I uh, I liked your list. Your uh, list. Listen to the customer bell curve. Um, sounds like being a good listener is really important. Um, can you recommend some resources to help me work on being a, a better listener to the customers? Uh, absolutely. The and the best way to listen is to make it easy for the customer to talk by asking questions. Uh, my favorite resource, now it's not geared towards our industry, um, I've modified it for my own use over time, is a book called Spin Selling. Spin, S-P-I-N. Um, the first time I heard of it, yeah, you know, the, the hair on the back of my neck stood up too because it sounds slimy because we hear about, you know, political spin and new spin. SPIN has nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> SPIN is just an acronym that describes four types of questions to ask. Um, and uh, uh, in, in Neil Rackman's paradigm, uh, it's situational problem solving, implication, and needs value. Uh, I, I don't needs value? What the heck does that mean? So when I talk about it, I talk about four different types of questions, but they're the exact same ones that Neil Rackman uses. Um, and again, the purpose of asking the questions is twofold. You ask the question so you can sit back and hear the response and figure out what the customer needs. Having to explain what they need or think about what the implications for something are or how important it is to actually reinforces those points for the, the homeowner. So now you're not selling them insulation. What you're doing is giving them a solution to their daughter's bedroom that's too cold all winter or the home office that kind of, you know, bakes on the west side of the house all summer long. Spin Selling by Neil Rackman. Uh, he actually has, I can't remember if it's a field guide or a field workbook. Um, it's a workbook that has exercise, perfect type of exercises for, uh, you know, you and, and your sales staff in, in training meetings to kind of work through. That sounds good, Mike. That's a nice little nugget. Thank you. Um, Another question in from a contractor, um, how, how do I know when to handle a business function myself and when to bring in an expert, for example, um, search engine optimization or something like that? <laughs> good, good question. Um, boy, there, there's a million answers to it. I don't know if we can uh, cover it here, but go, go back to sort of that, um, you know, what business are you in? You know, is there an opportunity with search engine optimization? Absolutely there is. Um, is it something you're really good at? Well, if the answer to that's no, then bingo, you've answered your question already. Bring in somebody else. Um, even if the answer to that's yes, yes, I'm really good at it, but is it what I care about? Do I want to spend my day figuring out and playing around with search engine optimization? Um, or, it, you know, would I rather be trading my sales guys and working with my production managers to, um, you know, to really optimize the rest of the business. You know, because if, if it is search engine optimization that really gets you all excited, well, maybe residential contracting isn't the right business, and there's nothing wrong with that answer, by the way. But it, if your expertise isn't there and you recognize it, boy, think about all the other value-added things you could be doing with your time um, which, and, you know, if you're an owner or manager, it, you, you should be paying yourself a lot of money. Your time is worth a lot. And, you know, there's services you can pay somebody less than an hour of your time to kind of keep a handle on this over the course of uh, weeks and months, whether it's search engine optimization or accounting um, or creative, you know, marketing or, or even sales training. That may not be what you're strong at. Um, so that may be an opportunity for you to kind of look look out there um, to the market and bring an expert in. Now, a lot of the stuff, you can actually develop the expertise over time. So the other question you have to answer, is this what I want to do and develop over time? Or, uh, you know, do I have the resources to bring somebody in to kind of power my way through that learning curve a little bit faster? There, there is no set answer, but those are the types of questions you have to ask yourself, and you're going to have to come up with your own answer there. Thanks, Mike. 
Um, another question, and it's a little vague, but um, what what tips do you have for hiring? <laughs> Great question. Um, and I think that, boy, the answer today is probably a lot different than it was 10, certainly 20 years ago, because it's, it's harder and harder to find, you know, good people with, within the industry. Now, the, the easiest way to hire, uh, in my mind, is to set up the systems and processes, you know, it, delineate what the job looks like um, everywhere from uh, entry level all the way up through expert with, you know, s several steps in between and have a process that you can kind of go through to turn somebody who is just an entry level person into an expert over time. Um, if you have those systems and processes and are willing to invest in training your people on a regular basis, now the neat thing is you don't have to hire based on a technical skill. You can hire based on the harder thing to teach, which is attitude. <laughs> um, but that only works if you're willing to invest in having those processes and willing to invest in the training so you can take that you know, green person and turn them into that expert. If, if short of that, uh, boy, there is no magic bullet because now you're competing against everybody else. You know, all the other hundreds of contractors who may be overlapping with you in one way or another, they don't have to be your direct competitors. You know, some of the skills kind of transfer from uh, one trade to the next, depending on what, you know, you know licensing and, and other requirements are. Um, but now you're competing against all those contractors, you know, for the five good guys who might be out in the marketplace rather than the thousands of potentially good people. I, I'd rather go the easier route, take the, uh, you know, work my way around to the competition with a much bigger uh, pool of folks. Yeah. And this is a kind of a continuation question. Um, does having good customer service mean everyone on staff has to be a good salesperson? Um, <laughs> Was this a softball? Because you know I'm going to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, so, something that I say all the time, marketing is everything you do, and sales is everything you do. Um, and, and think about that. You may have the best salesperson in the world, but if the – the, the customer, potential customer, calls in and they get crappy phone service, are they going to buy from you? No. You've already set the expectation that we're not a, a good company. Um, you know, if, if, if you've got some neat marketing but you don't show up on time or, uh, or you don't show up at all <laughs> or the sales guy is rude, um, you, you know, why are you wasting your money on the marketing? Because you're never going to get the, the close rates because the sales experience doesn't deliver on the marketing promise. Um, I talked about the importance of both employee and customer-generated referrals. They should be driving your lead business. Well, if the sales experience and then the, the installation process and the results on the back end you know, aren't causing a customer to smile, you will never have referrals driving your business. No, they'll be telling people to stay away from you. <laughs> Um, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in the company is actually writing contracts, but they have to know, you know the, what the company messaging is. We'll, we'll work on things like a gas pump pitch, which is how can everybody in your company describe what you do in 30 seconds. They don't have to parrot the same words, but they all ought to be offering reinforcing messages. Um, Everybody in the company does need to be reinforcing that messaging um, and delivering customer service because that's what's going to help you get more leads and close more deals. You, you can't, if you're relying on just your salesperson alone to do it or just your, your, your outbound marketing alone to do it, you're, you're not going to do it. You can't do it cost effectively. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, we want to make sure that folks uh, do remember there's, if any questions 
you have. Uh, there's a questions panel, so go ahead and use that uh, for any last minute questions here, and we'll we'll try and get them through. Um, a, a technical question came up. Um, what is the URL sign for the boot camp? Do you know that? Um, gosh, I don't. Uh, okay. Is there anyone from uh, Build a Green on? Maybe you can type it in. That'd be great. Um, I, I would recommend going. I'd recommend probably going to the Build a Green website. Uh, uh, info at or email info at Build a Green utility dot org and I'm sure we can get that. Yeah, Conrad, I'll, I'll suggest that uh, we circle with Build a Green and all the the folks who registered for the call today. We shoot that information out to them right away. Sounds good. Okay, and then um, another uh, question in. Uh, Definitely, I can get the book uh, e-myth on Amazon, but I'm planning on going to the hands-on training, the boot camp. Uh, can you repeat the numbers that you said that uh, should I bring to the boot camp? Um, I didn't capture all those, so. Um, yeah, sure. And uh, Conrad, maybe one of your staff can flash back to that uh, particular slide as well. Um, really, the, the more you have... Um, familiarity with the numbers in your business, the better all this is going to resonate. You know, some of the big ones, how much are you spending um, on a lead? What What is your lead cost? And not just your lead, but what is your acquisition cost? Meaning, how, what does it cost, uh, which, which is sort of the raw lead cost modified by how many of those leads converted to sales? Um, we can take that a step further, by the way, you know, how much revenue are you generating for the dollars you're spending on leads. And uh, it's good to have that number in the aggregate. We'll certainly talk about this next week. It's also really important to have it for each particular campaign or channel you use. Otherwise, how do you know? Um, other numbers that are going to be helpful to have are uh, close rates. Uh, we'll go over again what I mean by a close rate, and you can kind of translate my numbers to your numbers, um, what, what your average installation costs are. Because I can throw out industry averages. Um, I, I can't ever talk about any individual company that I've worked with and share their numbers with you. Uh, but I can talk about averages. What you need to do is kind of translate what might be an industry average into what you see. So then when we start talking about, for example, an Average HVAC job is $6,500. Well, if your average is $8,000, um, uh, you know, great, more power to you. Now, if I start talking about an additional opportunity with home performance, for example, adding insulation services in, and I say you can raise your average ticket, you know, by $3,000 or $3,500, and you get up to $10,000, you shouldn't be looking at the $10,000 number. You should be looking at that incremental difference. You know, boy, that's almost that's a 50% increase, or that's a $3,500 increase. Uh, so it's important for you to know what your numbers are, so you can kind of, you know, adjust any averages I get and give and turn them into something that resonates for you. Great. The the, uh, the other thing, the more you know all of your numbers, you know, uh, <laughs> the 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 more you understand how your business works um, and where you need to pull levers to make it work better. What, how much can I expect um, an average two-person crew to install on a daily basis? Um, you know, that, that's how you kind of build out the model and, and build out the business, make sure everything's on track. Um, and on a monthly basis, then, as you evaluate, you, if something's shifting from your expectations, you figure out why. Great. Great. Well, I think we're about out of time. I did get an email saying uh, from Build It Green that builditgreen.org uh, calendar. Go on the website and look at the calendar, and that should get you right to the URL sign up for the boot camp. Um, Mike, you've been great. This has been a terrific uh, opening for this um, for, for this webinar and then the forum series. And, um, yeah, do you have any final words or anything um, as we close up here? Uh, just thanks again to Efficiency First, to Build It Green, to PG&E for the opportunity. Um, and I look forward to really rolling up the sleeves with uh, many or all of you in person next week. Thanks so much. Great, great. Well, again, um, November 4th and 5th, Fresno, California, is, is the first uh, sales training boot camp. So um, definitely sign up for that. And uh, we look forward to um, future webinars. Thanks so much.